welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from one of our special guests. What I'd like to do today is share something really out of the first phrase of that video as I was standing on the rooftop of the Mission Center USA building in the San Fernando Valley. I started that video by saying everyone everywhere wants to see Jesus. You know, I believe that. You know, wherever I go all over the world, I've probably preached in 70, 80, 90 nations all over the world, and we see all kinds of people give their lives to Christ, and we're so grateful. But I know a lot of people around the world that see Jesus according to his life, but their life's never transformed. What I mean by that is we're, when we're in the Middle East, for example, at the Middle East Life Center, by the way, your church, Pastors Jim and Deborah, were the first people that came up to me after I announced the dream to pastors. And uh, your pastors were the first uh, people that came up to me and said, Keith, we are with you. We are going to give substantially to the, the, this in your church through your giving and your offerings. Gave substantially for four consecutive years. So I can tell you today that just eight months ago in December of last year, eight months ago, that Middle East Life Center is completely debt free. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. It's, it's because of precious people like you. That's why I believe there's surprises for you as you just participate really in the Freedom for Your Future campaign. So just let your heart be stirred and just get involved. If everybody gets involved and just does what our hearts are stirred to do, there's going to be more than enough. And God will surprise you with himself, with magnificent sufficiency called resources or money or revenue streams. And so don't be afraid, just go by faith and let the Lord do a mighty, mighty work in you and through you. But your pastors got involved with us and so that campus has paid off. But when I'm preaching in the Middle East, there's a lot of precious Middle Eastern people that know a lot about Jesus according to his life. But their lives aren't transformed through his life. See, when you understand Jesus according to his life, you can understand God is good toward you. But when you understand Jesus according to his death, you can understand God loves you. See, God loves you completely. There's no disappointment in the Father concerning you when you understand that your position before Him is not based on you. It's based on Jesus. See, most of us have a worldview that our standing before the Father is based on us. And I tell you, that's a pretty overwhelming, discouraging thought. How do I, in my humanity, qualify before the awesome, holy God Himself? How can I ever be good enough? I realize that I can't qualify on my best day. And I'm a gospel preacher. I realize that if I did qualify in myself on my best day, it would be a self-righteousness or righteousness which is of myself. And the Bible says that that is a stench before the Father. See, the righteousness that qualifies you before God is a gift to you found by faith in Jesus Christ. It's faith in him. See, when you get out of yourself and faith moves you into himself, the Bible says you're accepted in the beloved position. And when you're in Christ, God sees you through the work of the Lamb. And when God sees you through the work of the Lamb, you're good to God. And you're righteous before God. And see, this is news that we have to see and explain to people so people can, by faith, be overwhelmed with the love of the Father. And this is, I, I want to tell you a story in John chapter 12, which kind of explains the idea of seeing Jesus correctly. You can follow along with me in a Bible. John chapter 12, beginning in verse 12, there's a story. I'm just going to take time to paraphrase it for you. And uh, you can read it all, just make sure I'm telling you the truth. But in verse 12, Jesus is coming to Jerusalem for the very final week of his life. Jesus, the Bible says, had to set his face like a flint to go to Jerusalem because he knew his assignment in Jerusalem was to go to the cross. And Jesus has a conversation with the Father in the book of Hebrews where he said to the Father, Behold, Father, I've come to do your will. And then it says to take away the first to establish the second. The will of God for Jesus in the earth was to set up a new operating system which would qualify and pre-approve the whole human race before the Father through the one act of obedience of Jesus to the cross. And so Jesus understood when he was going to go to the cross, he was going to have to take our sin, the sin of the whole wide world, and receive the punishment for that sin and be separated from the Father and pay that price of punishment in the belly of the earth and believe that his Father would raise him from the dead. So Jesus was overwhelmed with this thinking. And in fact, even when he was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, 
he, 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 he said, you know, if there's another option, it'd be good to consider it. Nevertheless, not my will, your will be done. Remember when Jesus prayed that? So now Jesus is coming into Jerusalem in John 12, verse 12. It's what we call Palm Sunday. And everybody could see Jesus in Jerusalem at this time. There was a great feast, a great celebration. But everybody could see him according to who he was, but everybody didn't see the same thing. For example, at this feast, it wasn't just Jewish people who were there, but there were Gentile people who were there. The Jewish people had a covenant with God. It was the first covenant. It was the, it was the, the, the you know, the, the steward, the Pharisees had the stewardship of the law of Moses. But, uh, but they thought that their acceptance before the Father was in their own qualifying, in their own, their own uh, you know, ability to, to obey perfectly all that was written therein. But if you couldn't obey perfectly, the Bible said there was, there was an attachment to that covenant called the curse of the law. And so people were always under the bondage of trying to, uh, you know, be good enough or qualify to be accepted before the Father. But Jesus was coming. And Jesus was coming to establish a whole new operating system that through his obedience to the cross, you and I could find great life. So it's interesting in this story, the Bible says that as Jesus came into Jerusalem, people would line the streets. It was like a big parade. And people would wave palm branches and say, Hosanna, blessed is he who's coming in the name of the Lord. But everybody didn't get it. See, some people saw him as the Savior. Some people saw him as the Messiah. Some people got excited about their acceptance before God in what he was going to do. But others didn't see it. In fact, it goes a few verses later here in John 12. And it says, the Pharisees said one to another, look, the whole world is going after him. See, some people don't get what Jesus really has done and what Jesus has done to qualify everyone. But here's what's fascinating to me. Look at verse 20. John chapter 12, verse 20, the Bible says, Now there were certain Greeks. Everybody say Greeks. Greeks. Notice it wasn't the Jewish folk who had the covenant with God. It was the Gentile folk who were at the celebration. There were certain Greeks among those who came up to worship at the feast. Verse 21 says, Now they came to Philip, one of the disciples from the side of Galilee, and asked him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Now I think it's fascinating that a group of Greek guys got a hold of a couple of the disciples and they said, Listen, we really want to meet Jesus. We want to see Jesus. Don't you think that's kind of a noble request? We want to see Jesus. I think what is so astonishing is the way Jesus responded. Because the next verse says, two of the disciples came and presented Jesus the request. And they said, there's a group of Gentiles, a group of Greeks that have come. They want to see you. Jesus didn't say to the disciples, oh, let me go meet them. Let me go shake their hand. Let me give them a high five. Let me talk to them. He could have done that. If you want to see me after the service, I'll show you me physically. Jesus didn't respond like that. When they came to see Jesus, Jesus said something so significant. In verse 23, Jesus answered them saying, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. When they asked to see Jesus, Jesus refused to show them his life. Jesus begins to talk about his death. He begins to talk about him being glorified. Then in the next verse, he talks about if the grain of seed would fall into the ground and die. It abides alone, but if it dies, it brings forth fruit. He's talking about the fruit the Father's going to receive through his one act of obedience to the cross. Then he talks about his passion. Read the whole thing in context. These next 10, 12, 15 verses are thrilling. Jesus says in this text, And if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. Think about this. All of this now is a response to a question to be seen. And the question came from Gentiles. See, I believe Jesus was showing something so significant and powerful in his response to the people that wanted to see him. Jesus was showing us that for us to see him in his life doesn't give you a full display or a revelation of the love of the Father. What gives you a full display and demonstration of God's love for you is when you see Jesus in his death. When you understand that the cross is the significant act 
that separates the first system from the second system. And now our ability to stand before God Almighty doesn't depend on us. It depends on us being in Jesus. The beauty of the good news, friend, is to take your place in Christ and appraise the value of that kind of magnificent love. I remember when I was in Bible school many, many years ago. I went to... Uh, college, graduated from college, and I thought I was going to go into communications or business or something, but my last semester of college, I was called to preach the gospel to the nations. This was a long time ago. This was 1979, and uh, so I started going to different Bible schools and things. I went to a Bible school in Oklahoma, and I wasn't, I wasn't married or nothing. I just, uh, I just wanted to study the Word and prepare, you know, prepare for ministry. So one day I got my eyes off the word and I lifted them up and I saw a little lady. I thought, my, 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 my. Hmm? I saw somebody I wanted to meet. Her name was Heidi. Heidi now is my wife. Anyway, I wanted to meet her. I wanted to see her, but I was afraid to get close because I thought, what if she doesn't like me? What if she thinks I'm an idiot? What if she thinks I'm a jerk? What if she wouldn't have time for a guy like me? So I was so shy, I didn't know what to say. But God gave me boldness. You know, I, I, it took a little time. You know, I had to get prayed up, praise the Lord. But I finally made my way over there, and I had my wonderful line, whatever it was, probably high. You know, what's happening? That's about as brilliant as I am. But she liked me. <laughs> Hallelujah. I, 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 I liked what I saw, but I liked more when I got to know her heart. See, because when you get to know somebody from the inside, it gives you a picture of the possibility of love that can be triggered for you. See, do you really know or do you really believe that God loves you completely? Can you believe that in the Father there's no disappointment concerning you because he doesn't see you for you, but he sees you in the Son? See, if you can renew your mind to the place of your acceptance, which is in the Beloved, God has made you accepted in the beloved. If you can get delivered from thinking of yourself based on yourself, you will enjoy your own company. If you can get delivered from thinking of yourself based on yourself, you'll enjoy other people because you can see them from the position of the beloved and you can find, too, that they are accepted by God's love and grace. So let me show you, when you see somebody according to the death, instead of according to the life, like this uh, text here in John 12, this is where you get a demonstration or a, a display of the love of the Father. In fact, go with me in your Bible, if you would, to Matthew chapter 13. There's a couple illustrations that I think are kind of cool that uh, help us appraise the value of, of the love of God found in Christ. Matthew chapter 13, verse 44. This is a parable of the hidden treasure. The Bible says again, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure. Everybody say treasure. treasure. How many of y'all like treasure? Anybody at all? Man, I, I like treasure. But treasure is not just money. Now, we all like money and need money and these kind of things. But some, some of my treasures in life really aren't that valuable monetarily. For example, if you come visit me in my office, I have little drawings my kids did for me when they were two, three, four years old. I have them in my desk. Now, if I had a garage sale or a yard sale and tried to sell those, nobody would give me a quarter for them. So they're not worth money, but they're a treasure. You don't have enough money to give me for them. They're worth something to me because it's a sign of their love for their daddy. And it's a sign, really, of my love for them. It's a treasure. Now, the kingdom of heaven or God's rule in you is like a treasure, but it's hidden. It's not always revealed according to the outside. It's revealed in the depth of the inside, which a man found and hidden for the joy over the treasure. He goes and sells all that he has and buys the field. Let me ask you a question. When is God's love for you that you're accepted eternally based on the work of Jesus? When has that ever stunned you? When have you ever been just in awe? When have you ever just marveled at your acceptance before the Father and it's like even hard for you to believe? I mean, really, when I, when I uh, think about my acceptance before the Father, not based on me, that is the most thrilling thought my heart can ever have. It delivers me from me and sets me free to take my place in the beloved. It's a treasure. The guy said when he appraised the value of the treasure, he went and he did all that he could to acquire revenue streams to, to buy the field. 
See, when you're, when you're so addicted to the treasure of God's love for you, it motivates you to do things you never thought you would do. It motivates, motivates you to look at others and reach out to others in ways you'd never dreamed of. You know, some people, when they look at our little mission assignments around the world, they think that I just go around the world, you know, with a, like an idea to do something. Listen, what happens in my heart, it's like the treasure of the Father's love being revealed, and then it stirs my spirit to announce it. And go do it and proclaim the gospel of the good news of what Jesus has done. It's really, really wonderful. But the treasure will absolutely transform you. You can't transform yourself. The treasure transforms you. The treasure of God's love and acceptance of you in Christ changes everything. Look at the next verse, says the next parable in verse 45. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls. Everybody say pearls. How many of y'all like diamonds and pearls and, and, you know, precious gems? Yeah, treasures. <clears throat> They're kind of cool. Look at the next verse says, verse 46. Who, when he had found one pearl of great price, really speaking of Jesus, our position before the Father accepted, he went and sold all that he had and bought the treasure. See, when you're so, so attracted to the value of the treasure... When you appraise the value of the treasure of God's love for you, it, it does something to you. It excites you. It changes you. It motivates you. Uh, I was thinking of pearls. My wife, Heidi, of course, she's with me in the service uh, this morning. And uh, my wife, she likes pearls. And she likes diamonds. And she likes gems. She likes, she likes jewelry. But thank God she also likes, uh, she likes uh, costume jewelry. Thank you, Jesus. Because, you know, some of these treasures that she likes, I just can't afford. You know, I, they're just like beyond my sufficiency. But sometimes she likes things that cost five bucks. It makes me so happy. I say, buy it. Buy it quickly. Hallelujah. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm delighted that I still can make her happy with, you know, a little trinket or something. But, but we all like little treasures. Through the years of, of, of our marriage, you know, we've been married now over 30 years. And so... Different events, I get her some of the more real things, and at least she thinks they're real. But anyway, it's a, I, I, I like, you know, treasures. I remember many years ago, Heidi and I were uh, preaching, and in, in, uh, I was in Europe, and then we were on our way to Africa. I was preaching in Paris, and then I had to go to Amsterdam to catch a flight to Africa. And we had to take a train from Paris to Amsterdam, and we had to go through Brussels, Belgium. Now, I'd never been in Belgium, never been in Brussels, never been there since, since that particular day. But I'll never forget the train stopped in Brussels, and we realized we could get off that train and catch a later train and still catch our flight. So we could spend like six hours or something in Brussels and look around. So we said, hey, let's get off the train. This would be kind of cool. And I thought I could just, you know, relax and be nice and see the city and the architecture and walk the old cobblestone streets. And they have a segment in the town of just old antique stores all old European antiques. And one se section of the city is just old antique jewelry stores. Now, Heidi likes antiques and antique jewelry, so I thought I could just be a, a good you know, husband that day and you know, have a treat, have a down day for ministry and get a cup of coffee and we could walk the streets and have a good time. And I could go window shopping. Because window shopping never cost you anything. Right? That is a lie from the pit of hell. <laughs> anyway, anyway when, window shopping could cost you everything. Anyway, so I was thinking I was being nice. Now, when Heidi goes into an antique store, you know, I can go into the antique store and see everything in about 60 seconds. Say, okay, cool, let's go to the next store. Heidi, she has to look at every little thing. Sometimes I wait at the front of the store in a rocking chair and say, oh, God, move her along. Hallelujah bumper through this thing. Hallelujah. There's more stores to see. But I'll never forget that day we had our little coffee and we were looking in the windows of these antique jewelry stores. So you're in the window and all these little rings and necklaces and I just look in and say, okay, cool. Let's go to the next, you know. And Heidi's looking at everything. I said, come on, Lord, bumper along. Hallelujah. We got several streets. I'm kind of impatient, frustrated, but none of you men are like that. That's why I like you. <laughs> And so Heidi's looking at everything, and we're just getting to the next. And I think, okay, maybe by the end of the day, we'll get down the street here, you know. And finally, we stop in front of this window, and Heidi says, Oh, Keith, look at that ring. It's beautiful. I love it. My heart begins to quake. <laughs> and I said, Heidi, I don't see anything in there I like. 
And she said, oh, no, it's just a little ring. It's just got some little diamonds on it. It's next to that necklace. I said, oh, yeah, that's kind of cool. And she says, I love that. Now, what do you think my thought was? How much does it cost? I had to appraise the value of the treasure. See, some people can't appraise the value of the death of Jesus because they can't believe it's that good. See, most people still think it's going to cost them to qualify. Friend, you're pre-approved. You're pre-approved for everything. Most people stay on the outside and act religious. That's why a lot of people just have window shopping kind of religion. Drive by religion. Because they don't think they can be good enough to qualify. Your acceptance before the Father has nothing to do with you. Has everything to do with the Lamb. Has everything the one, to do with the one who, who gave his all. Jesus Christ. And so I was nervous because I saw the treasure and I was trying to appraise the value of the treasure and I thought, what if I can't afford it? I don't want to disappoint my wife, but this is where faith comes in. When you appraise the value of the treasure, you've got to have the courage to open the door and come on in. See, that's why when you hear about the message of the cross, you've got to have the courage to say yes. You've got to have the courage to accept the fact that you're accepted. And your acceptance before the Father has nothing to do with you. It has everything to do with Jesus. So just come in, come through the door. By the way, Jesus is the door. Remember, he said, I am the door. So you come in through Christ, and you're really in God. The Bible says your life is hid in Christ, in God. And now you're in the midst of the treasure. The Bible says all the riches and treasures of God are found in Christ Jesus. And when you step into the shop, it's like into the fullness of God. You came in Christ, and then you see the shop owner. He's kind of like the Holy Spirit. And I said, sir, I said, my wife likes a little ring you have in the window. He said, let me get it for you. The shop owner, the Holy Spirit, gets the ring, puts it in my finger. Now I'm not just looking at it from the outside. I'm handling it. You know, the Bible says you can handle the goodness of God. You can handle Jesus. Now it's different in my hands. And I take the little ring and I put it on my wife's finger, and I will never forget her face of great joy. She said, oh, Keith, I love this ring. And I thought, oh, my goodness. <laughs> you know, <laughs> what am I gonna do? So I said to the shop owner, I said, sir, my wife likes the ring. How much do you want for it? He said, well, it appraises for $750. I said, well, it may be worth $750 to you. But I'll give you 450 cash right now. I started negotiating with the guy. To make a long story short, I bought the ring for about $450. That was a miracle. Heidi, Heidi got the ring, put it on her finger. We came out. And even to this day, I'll always remember the only time I've ever been in Brussels. Every time she wears the ring, I'll always remember her face because she had a treasure that excited her. I still remember the time. When I got so excited about being accepted before the Father, Amen. not based on me. Amen. That was the most thrilling thought my heart ever was attracted to. Because, see, I used to always think that my acceptance before God had to do with me. In my perfect obedience, my perfect faith, my perfect giving, my perfect doing, my perfect whatever. So I was never too encouraged about my life before God based on me. I just wasn't good enough. But once I got addicted to the treasure of God's love for me, you know, the Bible says in the book of Romans chapter 5 that God demonstrates his love for us. While we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. So it's in the death of Jesus you find your life. So when the Greek guys came and asked to see Jesus, Jesus wouldn't show them his life. He showed them his death because he said, in my death, all the Greeks and all the Gentiles are included. He was giving you a picture of what he was getting ready to do. Go to the cross and display love. Display your acceptance. Display God's approval of you in Christ. And all we have to do is announce the news. I love how Paul writes about it in 2 Corinthians 5. He says, God was in Christ, reconciling the whole world to himself, not counting their sins against them. So we can announce to people, hey, blessed friends, be reconciled to God. Have the courage to come in the door. Have the courage to really accept your acceptance before the Father. 
Go with me, if you would, real quick to Luke chapter 24. Luke 24. This is one week later now, after the Greek guys asked to see Jesus. This is now the Sunday of his risenness, his resurrection. Jesus shows up to a couple of his disciples. It says in verse 15, while they conversed in reason, Jesus saw himself draw. Jesus himself drew near and went with them, but their eyes were restrained. They did not know him. Notice that he was with them, but they couldn't see him. In other words, they didn't get it. They didn't know who he was. So at verse 27, he began to preach to them. It says, at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Notice that Jesus preaches differently after the cross than he did before the cross. After the cross, Jesus will always use scripture, the law, the, the, the prophets, the Psalms, but he'll preach concerning himself. He'll show of his finished work that pre-approves you. That's the gospel. In fact, it goes on to say in verse 30, Now it came to pass as he sat at the table with them, he took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they knew him and he vanished from their sight. Let me ask you a question. This was a walk Jesus had with these guys on the road to Emmaus that was seven miles long. During the walk, he's with them and they don't have a clue who he is, yet he's physically there. So he preaches to them about himself through all the scriptures. Their hearts are warm, but they still don't get it. So what did Jesus do? He sat down with them and he broke bread. What's that a picture of? His death. See, when Jesus showed the significance of his death, their eyes were open. And then the Bible said he vanished. He was gone. See, the beauty of God's love for you is always revealed at the cross. That's why I think it's important that you keep the cross in every equation of your life. Otherwise, you'll misinterpret you. You'll misinterpret God. You'll misinterpret people. You'll misinterpret everything. If you don't view everyone and everything through the finished work of Jesus Christ, it'll show you how to reach people. It'll show you how to really convey that they're loved completely. They're favored abundantly. They're blessed eternally. All because of Jesus. Look at it says in verse 32 after he, he left. It says, they said one to another, did not our heart burn within us as he talked with us on the road, how he opened the scriptures? Verse 33, so he rose up, they rose up that hour and returned to Jerusalem, found the eleven, the other disciples who were gathered together, saying, the Lord is risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. And they told about the things that had happened on the road, how he was made known to them in the breaking of the bread. Notice, they testified that he was understood through the display of the cross. Through the breaking of the bread, Jesus could be seen and known. Then they go back and tell all the disciples. It says in verse 44, Jesus showed up in the room with all the disciples. He said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. Verse 46, then he said to them, thus it's written and thus it was necessary for Christ to suffer, that's the cross, and rise from the dead, that's his risenness or the resurrection on the third day, and that repentance and remissions of sin should be preached in his name to all nations. Everybody say to all nations. All nations. Say it again, to all nations. To all nations. Beginning in the Inland Empire or beginning in Jerusalem, beginning where you're at. In other words, Jesus defines the gospel Jesus says the gospel is about his passion, it's about the cross, it's about the risenness, and in that there's remission of sins for everyone everywhere, for Jew, for Gentile. It is, a, it is an inclusion for the human race. And we announce the news. And when you announce the news, you announce it in all nations. This is why I love going to the nations of the world. I like to invite people not to be drive-by believers, not to be window-shopping believers, but by faith, Appraise the value of the treasure and just come on in. Step into Christ, get loaded, get the ring on the finger, get the robe, get everything you could ever need and much, much more. It's all found in Christ because whether you know it or not, whether you believe it or not, or whether you like it or not, God loves you completely. And he, approved, he proved it to approve you eternally before himself through the finished work of Jesus Christ. Give the Lord a shout of praise. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah! That's why I told you at the beginning of the service to tell your friend, you look really good today. 
Because it's not necessarily the outer person where I'm talking about. I'm talking about you are accepted eternally before God because of what Jesus has done. Your sins have been forgiven. Your sins have been forgotten. You might as well accept the fact that you're accepted and be delivered from the addiction to yourself. You will be transformed by the love of God for you. I'm going to pray for you in a little bit, but pastor, come along. Praise the Lord. Give the Lord another shout. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Don't you like this course? I sing praises to his name. I sing praises to his name. Oh, Lord, sing it with me. Praises to his name. Oh, Lord, for your name is great and greatly to be praised. With your heads bowed, think about what Jesus has done. See him according to his death. See that you're accepted. Believe that you're righteous by the blood of the Lamb. Do it throughout your day. Do it throughout your night. Do it whenever you're worried. Let, uh, let God's love consume you. Maybe you're here today and you say, Keith, I feel like I'm on the outside. I know a lot about God. I know a lot about Jesus. But I'm always overwhelmed with me. Keith, I can't do it right. I can't seem to live right. I can't seem to believe right. I, I'm just so trapped. Friend, you're welcome to just come on in. Faith will get you there. Faith is the courage to accept that you're accepted. Faith is believing that you're good with God because of Jesus and what he's done. Take your place accepted in the beloved. Now, if you've never invited Jesus to be your Savior and Lord, I want to give you a chance to do that. So just quietly now as you think and focus on the Lamb of God. Some people think they got to do all kinds of things to be saved. They think they got to be good enough. They think they got to give enough. They think they got to pray enough. They think all kinds of things. They think if they're a member of a church, that saves them. If they sing in a choir, that saves them. But friend, the only thing that's good before God is the work of Jesus. And you gain that by faith, by believing. If you don't know that you know that you know that you know that you're good with God, today we're going to change that eternally for you just through a simple declaration of faith. I want to invite you to believe and receive the love of God for you today. The Bible says if we will believe in our heart that Jesus went to the cross, that he went to the grave, and that he was raised from the dead, if you can just believe that, the Bible doesn't say you have to fully understand it. It says if you can believe it, you'll be saved. And instantly you're from the outside and the inside. And then the revelation of God's love transforms you as you hang out in him. As you behold the Lamb, you're transformed into the very image of who He is. It's no longer up to you. You're free from yourself. I want to give you a chance to say a simple prayer. So with all our heads bowed, all our eyes closed, if you say, Keith, I really need to pray today. I need to give my life completely, wholeheartedly to Jesus Christ. I'm not going to embarrass you anyway, but I just need to know who I'm praying with and who I'm praying for. So if you say, Keith, I'm appraising the value of the treasure of God's love, and I want in on the love of the Father. I want to be accepted eternally in Christ Jesus. I'm believing that Jesus is real to me through his death. If that's your heart's desire, you say, Keith, I want that prayer. I want to know all my sins are forgiven, all my sins have been forgotten, that my sins have been eternally paid for and overpaid for through the work of Jesus Christ. If that's you and you want the prayer, on the count of three, I just want you to raise your hand. One, two, three. Would you do that all over? Here we go. Here's a friend. 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 Here's a friend over there. There's another friend. Thank you, my friend. 
up in the balcony area, Zinni. More people, there's a friend. Praise the Lord. Listen, what I'd like to do, I want you to be bold. I want you to testify of his love for you by just being you. And I want to invite all of you that raised your hands just to stand up. The Bible says if you will acknowledge Jesus before men, he acknowledges you before the angels of heaven. Now that's a cool deal. If you profess him publicly. So those of you that raise your hand, I want to pray for you up here. I just want to shake your hand. I want to look you in the eye and welcome you in, into the shop. I'm going to be the voice of the Holy Spirit to you and we're going to seal the deal on the inside. Those of you that raised your hand or you didn't raise your hand and you want in on this, come forward real quick for this prayer. Can you do that real quick? Come on. Come on forward. Those of you that raised your hand, come on. Come on. Back in the back. Come on, my friend. Come on. Over on the sides. Come. Oh, Lord, praises to your name. Oh, Lord, for your name is great and greatly to be praised. You're blessed, my brother. Sing it with us. I sing praises to your name. You're blessed, my sister. God loves you completely. Come on, my friend. The altar's open. Come on. Oh, Lord, for your name. Hey, you're welcome. It's kind of cool, huh? God's love for you is more than you can ever know. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. You know what? Right now, just put your hands on your heart. Say, Jesus, this is amazing news. It's amazing love. I believe in you, Jesus, in your death, in your burial, in your resurrection. My sins are forgiven. I'm good with God. I repent. I change the way I think, and I serve you instead of myself. I am righteous by the blood of the Lamb. Thank you, Father. I'm healed. I'm whole. I'm prosperous. I'm blessed in every way in Jesus' name. Give the Lord a shout, somebody. Hey, see this precious man? We just want to spend a couple minutes with you and give you some material. Just turn this way. It'll just be a couple minutes of your time. Give him a God bless you. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow, you repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin, and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth, that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Bye-bye.